Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children and all ladies, welcome to Tatami Talk. My name is Juan. This is my chicken partner, Anthony. This is a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. So, Anthony, how you been doing? Haven't seen you in two weeks. Good. Uh, got an update on my surgery. They're actually going to go ahead and do it. So, I'm happy that I don't have to push it back. So, that's, so it's going to be good. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's they're going to... Join you in no time. Yeah, but I have to show up earlier to get a COVID testing. Hey, that's still good in my opinion, all right? Yeah. I got one done. The city of Los Angeles is doing free testing for anybody that wanted it. Mm -hmm. So I went out, I got one. I know I'm clean for now. So either had it and it's gone or I haven't had it yet. I asked, like, is it an antibody test? And they're like, no, we're not giving antibody tests. And I was doing some research and they're saying that most of the the antibody tests out there actually aren't accurate. And they really haven't done any studies or anything. And the FDA just kind of let them go on the market because yeah. of the, the emergence the urgency of it so oh yeah yeah what's well, a big crazy event did they stick so. a thing up your nose or is it like uh <laughs> i had to uh, do a really big cough and then they shoved it down my throat swapped Ooh. it around and then i had cause i had to do it all myself actually it was really funny uh-huh. so i'm in my car and they give me this little they give me this little bag that has everything <laughs> in it and they're like all right so cough and like okay now touch the end go all as far as you can and swap around <laughs> so <laughs> it's L- pretty interesting <laughs> the l uh, i think la county is uh speeding up the the reopening so mm-hmm. i'm expecting the dojos to be allowed to be open soon we've been talking about that too lately and um like today if you read the news in la county at least uh, restaurants, restaurants are open yeah yeah, so that's the interesting I thing. I think they're so, getting uh, political pressure to do it because that's totally 180 from what they were saying before. <laughs> I could totally see that, but me personally, I'm still dining out. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i dining and going. I'm like, I ain't staying yeah, nowhere yeah. right now, all right? I'm getting my food in the car, taking it back home. That's yep. what I'm doing right now. But um, when it comes to the dojo stuff, we've already talked about, about like spacing things mm-hmm. out, and everyone has to wear a mask when they come to the dojo. And yeah, I think- me personally... I want everybody to get like those strap on masks so you won't fall mm-hmm. down. If you come with some paper ear ear one, I ain't letting you train. Sorry. I think uh, USA Judo has some guidelines. Um, or was it IJF that had some guidelines about reopening? I, I think it was uh, USJA came out with some guidelines about stuff. I think cause I got an email from them about it. Definitely. I'm sure all of them have something coming out soon. But yeah, yeah. I did. Yeah, I did get an email from them directly. So. So I guess so, um, everyone everyone's talking about the Travis Stevens uh, video series. Yep, that's about... the main thing to talk about today. So Travis Stevens did a video about what's wrong with USA Judo and how to fix it. And he was very blunt and direct and to the point about what he thinks is wrong and what needs to go right with it. He was actually saying, uh, I think um, every time he's like, oh, when I put this uh, thing up, because on YouTube it shows like, oh, at 5 p.m. I'm going to talk about this topic. Tune in, yeah. right? He says he's got a ton of emails and calls from USA Judo, like freaking out. <laughs> like, what, what are you going to talk about? And like, well, I see his point with a lot of stuff because he's gone to them directly, sent them e- well, from what he says in the video. Yeah. He sent them emails. He's talked to them and just give them the cold shoulder. And like, that blows my mind. One of the best American players has ever been, you know, lately right now, mm-hmm. silver medalist, goes out there, wins for America, and you're just going to blow him off. Like, yeah, whatever. Okay, we're done with you now. This guy's That's, grown up in the system, yeah. gone to the Olympics, did well, did much better than he was supposed to. We're Americans. We're not supposed to do that well in judo. Okay? International yep. judo, we're not supposed to do that well. And he did it. And this blew him off. That blew my mind. But he said it pretty well. Like, I think, it, I can't remember which part of the video, but he's saying, like, um, they don't really care about fixing things or improving yeah. things. They just mm-hmm. want to keep the status quo and yeah. basically just exist until they... It's, until it's, it's tough to perform. <laughs> Because you have people set in their ways, and people don't want to change. That's how anything is in life. You know? Yeah, because they have. He he said that they have money lying around somewhere, which I'm I'm sure they do. It's just not spending it. And yeah, I guess nobody wants to take responsibility in case things go wrong. Yeah, in case it blows up, up, no one wants yeah. to look bad. But yeah, you know, we got to build up judo somehow, somehow, some way here in America. We need to make it better. You know, make it more. I don't care about making it more profitable. I want to make it more mm-hmm. popular person that's my thing just like any endeavor just risks right yeah you know yeah so i know one of the first things he was talking about was that it's it's kind of harsh but he's cutting off the adults pretty much like his yeah, focus he, he, straight off he was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was like, straight up, like he was like adults, screw you I'm guys sorry 
Well, that's kind of like how he was. Like he did a, a podcast. I think it was mm-hmm. right after he won the medal or right before he was going to the Olympics, talking about what he has to do to train, how he had to go to Japan and go to France yep. on his own dime. He'd do everything himself. Yep. Like you would say judo wasn't sponsoring him with even enough money to go do stuff to how there was this weird thing where this company's supposed to provide him food, but you know, he's cutting weight anyway. So why are you paying him for get food for him when he's not eating yep. it? And I was like, I get it. You know, you come up from that harsh way. So like, you want to know what we cut off the fat. He always keeps saying cut off <laughs> the fat and just, I'm sorry adults, but you gotta fight for yourself. Now you gotta fight your own, find your own sponsorships, jobs, do whatever. But he's focused about the cadets and the juniors, which you got to think about the future. And I and also that. the focus of his video was basically producing high level judokas for in, in the competition scene. Mm-hmm. And the only time he really references like recreationalists or hobbyists is basically to get what what to charge them and how to get money out of them and what to give back to them to, to, to make justify them charging them money. To make them charge charge money, yeah. He's come but, up with good reasons to charge people fees to make them feel like they're progressing and doing growing in judo and showing that yeah. what they're doing also helping an Olympic sport. I think that was one of the interesting things. Like we need to promote judo as a self-defense and an Olympic sport, not just as grappling art. Or, so this might be my unpopular opinion, but yeah, I feel like people kind of overestimate how much people care about the Olympics, mm-hmm. especially judo. Like, Oh, people don't care about judo at all in the Olympics. Well, every four years we'll get like an influx of people more interested in judo after an Olympics, or especially after the last yeah. two ones, because we had Kayla Harris and him and Marty Malloy yep. did well. So we would get interest. But after th- games that people don't do well, you don't hear back from people. people I think it's like the there. World Cup, right? Like <laughs> every four years, people are like, oh, let's go to the bar and drink and watch the World Cup. And then like <laughs> back to football, back to American football, yeah, back to hockey. Like, oh, that, that. That soccer stuff. Get out of here. Get out of here. Like, oh, <laughs> and they complain about ball. how boring soccer is. But so, soccer is still getting um, popular here. It's like the numbers are steadily growing. And well, people are building stadiums it, and stuff. So It's always been weird to me with soccer. Because uh, for us being an immigrant country where everybody comes from other countries and stuff, every other country, soccer is popular. But you come to America mm-hmm. where everyone comes from another country and it's not popular. Yep. It's growing in popularity now. So I always thought that was kind of weird that soccer is so popular in Europe, Asia, South America, uh, Mexico, other countries. But then you come here and it's like, oh, no, no, no. That's weird. That, that foot soccer, that foot stuff's weird to me. I don't, I don't get it. When I first, because uh, I grew up abroad, when I first moved back to the U.S., when I saw American football, I was like, that's like a weird shaped rugby yeah, ball. Yeah, it really like, is. <laughs> when, I figured out, when I found out what rugby was like, oh, this is like, football without pads interesting yeah, I'm like why, why are they tossing the ball forward not backwards <laughs> but, back on topic back on topic yeah. kind of to make judo popular in america so yeah so one of the things is like um making people feel like they're contributing to the martial art of judo mm-hmm. and doing not just the martial art but but uh, selling it as a self-defense yes so so he said there was three types right um mm-hmm. martial artists or hobbyists the competitors and then self-defense like yeah. that he's saying that's like three types of people he's going to market towards and he's saying that the self-defense ones like where all the money at and i i can see that like a lot of people take all the these even like dojo places just because it's advertising and self-defense right oh yeah yeah well i get a lot of people when they first come into dojo they ask about using judo as a self-defense or they hear about like, oh, I hear judo is a really good self-defense for smaller people or for women. I'm like, yeah, it's a great self-defense. And then you get some other people, like other black belts, they'll be like, oh, judo as a self-defense. You want to do you learn self-defense, go buy a gun or get a knife. And it's like, no, don't tell them that. <laughs> Keep them. Be like, yes, self-defense. You have to sell it. Like whatever people want, I, I sound, I'm going to sound terrible saying this, but whatever people mm-hmm. want to hear, tell them. And then they'll learn <laughs> what it actually is, you know? So the, the biggest, I mean, we talked about like grabs already, but yeah. the other thing is, first thing people are saying, it's like, how is that going to work without a gi? Like, for example, mm-hmm. um, collar chokes. Like, how would you do that when yeah. people don't even wear jackets in California, right? So. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I, it goes think, back to yeah. 
it's about people that having a more open mind about grappling, more open mind about judo itself is that you have to learn, it, actually you have to learn a little bit of wrestling and know how to do a proper <laughs> underhook, overhook, double over, double under, a head and arm and stuff. And just adapting judo from there. Because like I always say, I always go back to it, like I do catch wrestling on site. Oh, you guys hear the cops outside? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I don't know there's I'm riots gonna, going on soon, no, so I hope they're not here for me. But um, so when I go to catch wrestling, because I wrestle and I put judo together and I throw people with underhooks and overhooks all the time doing stuff like that. And I think we should every now and then like maybe teach that in a judo class, teach as a self-defense. Like if someone grabs you here, get an overhook on the person, go for a taitoshi from there, or go for an equal sonagi from there. Or get a headlock, do kosher groom, which is super easy from a head and arm position. Yeah, I think uh, I think competing and randori are like the two best ways of basically training for self defense. Because mm-hmm. you go to like any Krav Maga class, they'll be like, okay, if he grabs you here, then you do this and you do this, but that's not really pressure testing. They call that mm-hmm. pressure testing, but it's not really. Cause, it sounds almost okay. kind of like a karate one step almost. You're yeah, karate self defense. So what, what I mean. At least for me, the first thing that whenever I, we go to tournaments with new people, their first tournament, and this is the same experience for me, your first tournament, your adrenaline's pumping. And mm-hmm. after your first match, you're like, what the hell just happened? I don't even remember <laughs> how I got thrown or, or what I did. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's, that's basically, I think, as close as it gets to the real thing of being attacked. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Like your adrenaline's it's, pumping. You it's, don't, it's, you, it's like fight or flight. Fight or flight. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in a tournament, you're fighting for reals. Like I said, it's totally different. That's why I think people evolve more quicker and get better at judo mm-hmm. when they go compete more because you're going to see it in a real situation. Like there's things to doing stuff. In yeah, you start. Uh, there's things doing at Ron Dory when you're not going to get hurt. When you're at tournament, he don't know you. You don't know him. You guys are both going 100% at each other. You start getting used to the adrenaline and the breathing and you control it and you're, you're able to make – better decisions more calmly i think that's the value that judo provides for self-defense because mm-hmm. you can go anywhere else and learn any of the, the throws and grabs and chokes but without that pressure testing that judo provides oh yeah i, I think that's what judo can bring to the table yeah because even when judo like even with just doing a lot of run or you're still getting tossed in a fire you're still fighting mm-hmm. people it's not a hundred percent because you're at practice and you know them yep. or they should know you but yeah, we spar all the time. That's how we know what works and what doesn't work, you know, in yep. any type of fighting. You want to know what, what, like, it's sink or swim, you know? You know what yep. works, you know what this Ippon Stonagi works, you know, Taitoshi works, Ogoshi or anything, what doesn't work, all right? So that's also, what we do. Yeah. We just do a lot of randori. You learn what's good for you, what's not good for you. And also when you train, you kind of learn, like, I mean, Sensei Philippe always talks about how anything can happen in judo, right? Yeah. In a judo anything match, happens. anything can happen. So you, think about on the streets <laughs> where there's like more variables. You you kind of yeah. you kind of learn to respect that and would try and de-escalate things before you would resort to using your your training. I think, which yeah. is a good thing. Yeah, but that's the teaching judo the self defense. And you gotta when people ask, "Oh, is judo self defense?" You gotta say yes. You gotta be like, "Yeah, you learn how to throw people. You get put in a bad situation." Mm-hmm. But you got to say yes. You can be like, oh, no, no, it's not a self-defense. No, no, it's a sport. Like, no, no, we got to move judo in the way of the self-defense, the martial arts self-defense. That's what people talk about BJJ. People talk about the yeah. sport of BJJ. People talk about BJJ as self-defense. So let's say Travis Stevens plan to market as a self-defense class. I, w- I would imagine with a program, ideally, you would have to do some sort of no-gi, right? If he were to develop a uh, self-defense program to teach he did mention something about uh gi-less judo or no gi i can't remember what it was exactly what, what do talk, you think did, how would you that. market it how would you market it off a guy in the street saying like hey put on this gi and we're going to practice some self-defense like that doesn't sound very realistic if i didn't know judo right when i teach when i teach some um, certain throws and i say how to do it without a gi i first show it with the gi and then sometimes i'll show it not using a gi so it's not like you take the gi off or anything. Like you keep the gi on, but I say, say so instead of getting a collar and you're going to get an elbow grip right here, I say, okay, so instead you're going to get an underhook right here, okay? Mm-hmm. You're going you're gonna to get an overhook here. You're going to get an underhook right here, and that's how you get a guy. Or you grab him behind the neck and hold him. Or if I, might, or I say, like, hey, maybe you fight a guy during wintertime. 
or you'll be somewhere cold and they have the jacket. Totally easy. Yeah. You already have things right there. But you have to tell people, because some people can't think past what they see. Yep. All they see is a gi. That's all they think about is 100% the gi. You got to think about what if they don't have the gi on. Okay? So what you're saying is you have to practice and start teaching these wrestling grips, basically. Yeah, pretty much. You have to start yep. learning some wrestling grips. I agree. I think uh, I think it's judo's judo. You're, you're, you're sensing the off-balancing of your opponent and yeah. everything else. You just kind of have to adapt to it. Mm -hmm. well, it's like so, when I get people that come in from other styles. And mm -hmm. I think the judo Ipo Sonagi is the most superior um, shoulder. Th I'm going to put it in the shoulder throw family. There is. Mm -hmm. Because when I get a guy and I put his arm right here in my elbow in this little pit right here, and I, and I grab him, I own them for the most part, unless I got it really tight, but I own them right there. Now, if I put someone on my shoulder, like how they do it in wrestling or sambo or some other styles I've seen, where if, like when I was in um, high school and I learned how to do a shoulder throw, when I'm throwing a guy, I have his, his arm right around my neck right here. And in wrestling, you don't think about it because in wrestling, you can't get choked. Yeah. But if here you have to think streets, about that. Yeah. The streets are in the real life or in judo. If I put my arm around a guy right here trying to throw him, he's going to get me a harakajime. Yeah. Okay. Give me a bulldog choke or a front face lock or something. So that's why I think when you have it in judo, boom, you hold him right here. They can't get away. And I can do that with a gi or without a gi. And I just think it's meaner without a gi because when I do with a guy without a gi and I grab the wrist mm -hmm. and I pull him in right there, I'm pretty much torquing their arm. Like I'm putting all that pressure on their elbow mm -hmm. as I'm throwing them. So it's actually a possibility I might break their arm also while I throw them. So do you, do you agree with him about dividing up in three, three types like that? I think it's going to be very tough to teach all that. I think it'd be very tough to teach because yeah. most dojos only have one class. And, and you, you have to cater everyone. That's the challenge, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think if you do those three types, you'd have to start either dividing class into two, like you do martial art and self-defense class and then judo competition class. I think so I guess... Do, I think if you do judo, self-defense, and martial art together, mm -hmm. I think you do those together. But if you're doing judo competition, you might get martial artists in with the competitors, but I don't think you can get the self-defense in with... I don't know. It's tough. That's what's hard about it. You have to try something else. You have to try something new. I don't. I basically think the nonprofit dojos wouldn't be able to do that, but the full time ones that pay rent and can use a space like mm -hmm. anytime they want can totally hire. Like, I mean, if it's your own business, you just run more classes, right? Yeah. So, well, the other thing also that um, you know, something we struggle with is that we've talked about dividing classes also. Like, sometimes mm -hmm. we'll have a lot of people will have like 20 people, 25 people, sometimes 30 people on the mat at one time. We're like, damn, this is great. We'd have two classes. Maybe we'll divide like a the beginner's class <laughs> and then we'll do an adult, uh, an advanced class mm -hmm. and then we'll do it and no one shows up. We'll have five people in the, in the advanced class and mm -hmm. four people in the beginner class. And it's like, wow. So why one thing this? I, one thing from the stream that I did agree with what they said was, if someone was paying 125 or 200 bucks for a month for judo, they're going to show up. They're, they're not going to be like, oh man, I, I don't feel like going today. Like, let me just stay home. They're, they're going to be like, I'm, I paid 200 bucks for that. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not skipping. It's a weird thing where people, if it's a good value, if it's a good deal, like see judo is a good deal right now. Like mm -hmm. our dojo only charges what, 40 bucks for Adults, auto pay yeah. 50 bucks for 50 bucks for cash 40 bucks for auto pay yep which is a great deal but some people be like oh well it's so cheap is it really going to work is that a good is that, is that really effective it's so cheap so they think that if they see something more expensive i'm going to learn more from it and the thing with judo is that it's always been a cheap martial art it's always been a cheap martial art well there are still those people that come and they're like wait i got a pay usa judo and i gotta buy gi and i gotta do this and that and adds up the upfront cost adds up to like close to 200 bucks yeah and it, they'll just walk away I'm <laughs> i think there's that's the type of people that hear that judo is cheap and they see that it's only the 50 bucks yeah. up front they're like oh it's only 50 bucks and then it turns into 200 like whoa, whoa that doesn't make sense but if i go to any karate dojo mma dojo MMA there's gym, contracts MMA, just, there's contracts contract there's sign up fee it costs way more like Years ago, we had a TV show, like, oh, no, it was like two years ago, we had a TV show filmed at the dojo. And one of the grips there, like we're just talking, he's like, so how much you guys charge here? And we're like, oh, well, our kids are $30, our adults are 40 to 50. He's like, 40 to 50? Kids are 30? 
He's like, yeah. He's like, man, my kids in Taekwondo, I spent a hundred and something, like a hundred and something a month on them. We're like, well, yeah, judo is usually a much cheaper martial art. I was like, don't spend that on Taekwondo. But when it comes to judo, just spending the initiation fee and buying a gi, it's, I don't know. Maybe we should give paper gis like Taekwondo does out to everybody. <laughs> You get that free gi when you sign up. And if you ever gone to Taekwondo Joe and get that free gi, it is paper, okay? It is a rice paper gi. It tears immediately. I mean, if, if we charged more, then I think you could do that. Like, give a free gi. Because worst comes to worst, you just break even, right? If they take the gi and then they don't, they, after a month they quit, you just break even. So I guess let's, so. Let's but, say a gi, a gi costs like okay. 70 bucks. You charge 80 a month. Mm-hmm. Then you just kind of like either – you if they only train a month and they don't show up anymore, then you just like yeah. break, kind of break even. You don't lose anything. The only thing with that, and it's the fear of losing students is that I charge 80 and give you that free gi. That person might go online and see another dojo that's only 50 or 30 or whatever they're charging. Uh, yeah. Without the gi. And they'd be like, Oh, well, they're only 30. I guess I'll go buy a gi, but I don't know. You- so I, I guess that's, that's uh Travis Steve. One, one of his argument is like people, everyone just needs to charge more saying yeah. you can't just have one place charging more and one less. And yeah. I know there are some dojos out there that are like charging 150 and 200 mm-hmm. and they'll go around saying like, see, you can do it too. But it's like, you don't have any competition around. Right. But in, L- so in a place like well, LA or New York, well, New York's different because of the rent. But yeah, if like, like, like you just said, if you're the only one charging 200 and everyone else is charging 50 or 30, then you got to get show, have something to show for it. Like, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like when you compare prices, like we compare prices with stuff like that like us at our dojo we do a ten dollar mat fee as long as you got a usjf usa judo usja card you want to come visit the night come show us your card ten dollar mat fee you can train when i go visit my family in the bay area uh, there's one dojo i go to in santa clara that's uh, that has an open mat on saturdays they're 25 when i the first time i went there and they told me it's 25 i was like whoa I, i'm not <laughs> buying a day pass here i, I paid 40 i paid fee. 40 when i trained in New York. Yeah, you told me you did 40 before. There's yeah. a place that I'll, I'll train at when I go visit other family in the Central Coast area near uh, Modesto. And they did a, like a $5 mat fee. I think it was 5 or 10 But it wasn't that expensive. But when I go to Bay and I want to train there on the mat, it's 25 Like That blew me away. I was like, 25 So you, <laughs> so you, you do think that's gonna, it's a good way to fund the, their competitor system, right? You don't, you don't think, because I think in, in, um, in return, he was saying, like, we'll give you, like, a promotion system, an online mm-hmm. promotion system. You can check your rank, and well, you can, like, look at I, videos and stuff. So like that's what you're getting for your money. Is that he had a system in place where people can see which level they need to get to. There was, I need to do this to get to here, to get to orange, to get to green. I like that. I like where people can go online, see exactly what I they like want. that. It's a stable but system. I, I don't think it should be centralized mm-hmm. for at least – for 90% of people out there who aren't competitors, I think mm-hmm. it should not be centralized. It's kind of like... Well, that's um, why he has three systems. Yeah, but it's still, like, you're, you're basically using the national government body to, to force, like, one style of judo to everyone, which I that's think That's another thing he was talking about at the end when you're talking about when you face a jet, when you see a person don't have no flag on them, no sticker, nothing, and you watch them style, you see, oh, that's a Japanese guy. You watch that style, like, that's a Russian guy. You watch that style, that's a French guy. Uh, excuse me. In America, we don't have that. Everybody has their own style. Everybody has their own. We have a style. Things. It's Nawaza. <laughs> Nawaza. <laughs> no, not every American does really good Nawaza. Not all American players well, do really good. All, all, the, all the ones that have won medals, I think, are really good at Nawaza. Mm-hmm. But um, I guess my point is, I'm, I'm going to use Kung Fu as a as an example, even though it's there, there are caveats to it because Kung Fu, some of them just bullshit and. <laughs> So what I'm saying is you're gonna make me get in a fight, people, aren't one, you? <laughs> one thing with, with um kung fu is you, you have to pick a, a, a master, a sifu, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And each lineage has their own style. And when you look at someone fight, like you go like, okay, that that guy does things this this way, that guy does things this way. Even even though they're both teaching the same, like let's say that, let's talk about Wing Chun since I learned Wing Chun. Mm-hmm. One guy one guy does things one way and the other guy does things some other way, but that's their style. 
because yeah. they developed it based off of their own fighting experiences and and learning experiences right yeah. but if you have like a top down like one organization pushing down one style saying this is the only correct way of doing Tayotoshi or this is the only way to do blah 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 or you know like I, I feel like that's detrimental to um, developing judo in different styles and having different styles like kind of help push judo further and evolve well i think he was meaning that it's mostly just the competitors that there's an american competitive style you know, the american yeah but, competitive but he's selling this whole system to yeah. also the to also the um, the students right yeah so if i if i was your for example like if we're teaching taiotoshi to the kids or to adults and mm -hmm. let, let's say we test them i expect you to do taiotoshi the way i taught you not you know the one-sided grip some people do like yeah. the sleeve and and it's not that it doesn't work it's just that i'm not testing you on that right now mm. right or an underhook tayatoshi like we're not testing mm. that right but if let's say travis stevens is like okay we're going to test you on the like some weird koshikuruma style tayatoshi or something i don't know like where you just grab the neck mm -hmm. then everyone's going to start doing that and less people are going to be able to learn different styles of judo I think judo is going to be kind of like, wa I don't want to say watered down, but it kind of consolidates into just one thing, right? It's going to become more limited, but he even talked yeah. about that. He said that if you're a competitor, you're not going to learn. Like a, a throw that we always talk about, because I make fun of you about it all the time, is Hanagoshi, okay? Mm -hmm. So he was saying that a competitor would never learn Hanagoshi because a competitor would never do Hanagoshi in a tournament. It's not a tournament throw. But if you're a martial artist, or if you're, um, what was the other one? Martial artist or... Um, or a better? No, no, he was in competitors. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, self-defense? Self-defense, yeah. If you're self-defense yeah. or a martial artist, you'll learn Hanagoshi, okay? But if you're a uh, competitor, you're not going to learn Hanagoshi. Was it Hanagoshi you said? Was it Hanagoshi. Hanagoshi. Was it Hanagoshi? Okay, that was well, Hanagoshi. There, there are senseis in this area who their, their technique was Hanagoshi, right? Mm -hmm. Like the the head of Gardena Judo, not the head of Gardena Judo. He's from Gardena Judo, but forgot his name for a second. He, he taught me Hanegoshi, like the way he does it. And he, mm -hmm. that was his throw back in the day. He, mm -hmm. He's like, he, I think he's like 80 something and he's still like <laughs> teaching. That's, him. A, that's a long that's, day ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but my, my point is like, it's, we need people, we need people to have different styles and pass down these different styles is what I'm saying. But it's like we talked about last time with leg grabs and stuff, how, Okay, I still teach leg grabs. Some people don't teach mm -hmm. it because they don't see it for competitive. If you can't do it for competition, that's another mm -hmm. thing that would happen probably. Travis Stevens saw would go on. You can't do leg grabs. So will competitors learn any leg grab techniques? Probably not. Mm -hmm. But martial artists would learn them. Uh, self-defense guys would definitely learn them because they're great for self-defense. So you, you think it should be centralized, the, the syllabus? I think it would help out a lot. I think you, it would help out a lot to advance people. You don't feel like that would take away the power from... Well, I'm saying power, but like the the style of the dojo, like you know, like this dojo does things this way. This dojo yeah. has really good nawaza. This dojo has really good hip throws. You know, like you don't think I it's think gonna take away still, stuff like that. I think people would still learn it. I think people still teach it. It's just that there's um uh there's a base that you should learn first, and then you learn stuff on top of it. Okay. And I see it's just a way to get better American players. You know. And it goes to his part of that. It's not just that, but the thing is that him teach having one coach, you know, and he talked about mm -hmm. even having one cadet and one junior coach that's going to travel the country and either teach, teach clinics, seminars, yeah, to seminars, raise money. teach yeah. seminars and stuff to help build the money to help USA judo and help players, but also look for, look for the future, you know? Yep. And with that, for the adults, he said, like for the USA, the international competitors, that they would have to go to one central location to go train at, which is yeah. tough. It's tough. But you but you have to totally move for a job, right? Me. Yeah. It totally makes sense to me. If I'm paying you to do judo, if I'm paying you to go get medals and go do well and make America look good, it blows my mind that they don't. I don't understand how they don't do that. Every other sport pretty much does that for the most part. Yeah. Every Olympic sport trains in Colorado or trains at where the best or uh, the optimal, the most optimal place for their skill to train at but a judo doesn't 
we have people, uh, we have people in San Jose, we have people in Los Angeles, we have people in Colorado, we have people in New York or, or at Boston, like yeah. him and stuff. We have people all over the place. How do they not all train together? Is that old I, saying? Steel I think it's politics. Steel, iron sharpens <laughs> iron. And even like, even how he was saying is that how America is so big, we forget how big America is. Yeah. You know, I get that. And we should have maybe two locations. Now he was saying centralize everybody to their Boston. But what if we do Boston and San Jose? You know, mm -hmm. I know a lot of competitors train at San Jose already. You know, we have a lot of the U.S. team and the, and the junior team train there already. Want to make you can either go to Boston or you can go to San Jose and train. Make two places where you have to go, and you got to choose one or the other. And they're both on separate coasts. You can't be like, oh, well, this one's closer to me. You divide the middle. Your choice. So for for that coach that he talked about hiring, yeah, I don't know if you saw this part, but or remember it. He said that he doesn't think that we should hire a Japanese coach. I get it. Do, I totally, do you agree? Yeah, I agree because it's one thing that I talk about um, with other people that there's cultural differences. Mm -hmm. There's stuff that people expect in Japanese culture that they're raised knowing. And when they come to America and see American judo and see American training, they like they don't understand it. Like bad bowing, people taking shoes on the mat, people being very um I but you're paying you're relaxed. paying them you're paying them to do something right so they yeah. kind of just have it's it's like paying a Japanese chef to come cook at a nice restaurant mm -hmm. here they're cooking Japanese food they have to adjust they can't expect things to work exactly like they do in Japan I don't know <laughs> I've seen some <laughs> Japanese players that have been like that and I've he ma he mentioned I think uh, I think it was a Czech Republic they hired a mm -hmm. Japanese coach yeah so, no. Was it the Czech Republic? I think it was Czech. Okay. He became a citizen but, too. Oh, oh, good for him. Yeah. But I think we have, right now, we have a great opportunity with our players, you know, with Marty mm -hmm. Malloy. Well, Kayla Harris is doing MMA right now and stuff, and Ronda Rousey is doing whatever she wants also. But we have like Ronda, I mean, not Ronda, we have Marty Malloy, we have Travis Stevens that I think could help, uh, help grow the sport of judo and make us into a better competition country. You know, and Travis wanted, it seems like he really wanted to help. It seemed like he really, really wanted to help grow judo and fix mm -hmm. stuff. But the status quo was just like, nah, I think they're fine the way they are right now. I think he was just a little too nice to say what the real reason is. But mm -hmm. I, he said, he said that the way he worded was they won't respect him was what he said. The Japanese guy? The Japanese judo. Um, if you hire a Japanese coach, they won't respect him, which... I kind of get because um, mm -hmm. one of my first judo tournaments was, I think it was at the President's Cup. I mm -hmm. I was there and there was a Japanese player. Um, I'm not, I don't want to expose who it was, but basically um, <laughs> there was a Japanese player fighting and some, I've heard some stuff that people said in the crowd that just wasn't very nice. Let's just some say it that way. People were being racist, weren't they? Basically, people yeah. People were being racist. Yeah, they're like, they're they're basically implying like oh he's good but let's see what he's gonna do this this time like it was kind of like it was very dismissive and um, well it's terrible to say but people feel that way in different parts of the country I'm not gonna say what parts because you know where you came from and you know what part that was but certain people are like that the one thing I do see when I am like me being in California I mean I've been in California tournaments I've been in Nevada tournaments and stuff so. I've Travel. I've only competed in two states for the most part. Is that at least here? I think people give over um, over respect for Japanese players. They see someone's from Japan. They have a black belt. They're just like, "Oh my god, he's from Japan. He has a black belt. Oh, he must he must be a master." He must I think that's belt. true for people who don't who don't really know judo, right? But I feel like the people that actually compete a lot, they're like, "We, I want to do it my way, the American way, and mm -hmm. beat them our way." Is what. Yeah. Which is fair because mm -hmm. I, I agree that just because something works for Japan doesn't mean it's going to work for us. Absolutely. We had established an American style of judo, you know, American way. Mm -hmm. America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so I who like do you think about stuff, you know? Who do you think, the, who, who do you think they should hire then? I think if, I really like the idea of someone that grew up in the system and knows how it works and, and know what works internationally. So I think like Travis Stevens is a great idea. I think Marty Malloy is a great idea. I think Kayla Harris would be an amazing idea. Those are people that have done really well internationally in judo 
and understand the American system. And people would respect them because like, oh shit, this is an American player. They came from the bottom. They came all the way up. I get that. But like, like, as you said, though, like just because you're a good player doesn't mean you're a good coach. Oh, yeah. I've seen that with lots. I've seen it with people already. But I'm saying with okay. those examples, that's what I would like to see mm-hmm. or how I think would be a great idea because if you see one of them through on the mat, you automatically mm-hmm. give them respect. You automatically, you see them as an American and you're like, damn, they, how far they went. Okay? That's true. The Olympic medalists are right there in front of me. I got to listen to them. I got to take what he says seriously. Where if it's just some other guy that's just, if he was just a decent competitor, did mm-hmm. well, but he, but maybe he might be an amazing coach. He's a great mind for judo, but people might be like, yeah, but you know, he didn't do that well though himself. So regarding these seminars that he talks about hosting, um, he mentioned um, he hosted a seminar once mm-hmm. for I think it was seventy dollars for two, a two day seminar. Yeah, and only two people showed up. Like, and the Shit, two like people, happens, man. and the two people were the ones that were helping out with the mat, um, laying out the mats before everyone comes, so they don't ha- mm-hmm. they didn't have to pay for it. Yeah, and I I went to a couple clinics and. I, I wouldn't say that my experience was as bad as his his was, where mm-hmm. like no, basically no one showed up. But mm-hmm. um, one, one was the Neil's Ad, Neil Adams uh, clinic, and the other one was the Nicholas Gill clinic. Huh. While people did show up, majority of them were majority of them were kids. Yeah. So, as an adult, it's kind of like hard to to train, practice, and and drill the stuff that they're teaching. Well, for me, when I think about those clinics, I, Mm -hmm. okay, I just turned 38. Okay. I just turned 38 two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. My competitive years are for the most part behind me. All right. I still compete because I love competing, but I know I'm not going to be a international competitor. I'm not going to be there at UST. So when I think about those clinics, I like to tell the younger guys to go there. The guys that are Mm -hmm. teenagers, the, the, guys and girls they are teenagers they are in their early 20s and stuff i think they'll learn the most from that clinic let me finish off my thought first so basically i got there and Mm -hmm. i was paired up with a bunch of kids yeah and it was really hard enough trying to remember everything that he's teaching you because he's teaching like all this stuff like really fast 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 like Mm -hmm. try and fit it fit as many as many things in as possible yeah but you're you're not allowed to record (laughs) <laughs> and I'm not going to run off the, I'm not going to bring a notebook onto the mat and no flash but, photography. <laughs> you're not allowed to record. And here I am like trying and fit my long ass limbs and t- <laughs> huge ass feet in between this, the, the armpit of this tiny kid. Like, you know, it just doesn't work that well. And I'm trying to remember this and bring the stuff back to my dojo and share it, share it to people right? with people. Right. Yeah. I think I learned like, a lot of useful things that day, like at least 20 things. And mm-hmm. I just remember probably three of them. So, That's and that was a two day, that was a two day yeah. seminar. A two day um, seminar, three things. If it, if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't a two day seminar, I, I probably would have only remembered one thing. So how would, how would you, how would this seminar thing that he's talking about work? If someone who's like Neil Adams or someone with Olympic medal can't even pull adults to, to show up to these things. Well, if you remember, he said that they'll be mandatory for the cadets and the juniors. That'd be okay. mandatory. So it'll that. just be a bunch of kids again. It'll, it'll be it'll, like what he's doing. Well, with his, whole thing is about, his whole thing 24. about growing the next generation. His whole thing about growing the next generation. Mm-hmm. Like you said, adults, sorry. If you're 25, you're 23 or whatever, sorry, you're past. You're gone. All right. And I can understand with him wanting to help the next generation become better judo players. But and I do think... But he's a... He's talking about raising money. You can't. I, I get most of them are kids, but yeah. if you exclude adults, the one with the money, mm-hmm. and I know some of these parents pay for a lot of the shit, man. Pay they do, a but these, a lot of these, maybe uh, if they make camps. these seminar, if they make these seminars into a summer camp, I'm sure they'll like a judo summer camp. I'm sure they'll do that. They'll pay pay like whatever amount, right? Like he, mm-hmm. he mentioned at one point, like daycare costs more than judo, right? Yeah, and well, the first thing we do is that. I think it's weird when seminars are just one seminar for adults and kids. I understand mm-hmm. they don't want to, um, cause they're scared that people won't show up. So they just want to combine it together. Mm-hmm. I think they should always separate seminars. I think there always should be like a youth hour or a youth two hours and then adult two hours. They have to pay more money that way then. In a sense, they, cause, cause of the, the, the space they're using and yeah. Well, most and people have their own time. dojo, you yeah. know, I know it's a person's time and stuff, but 
this is just me. Like I'm, I'm more on the side of always like helping people out and trying to mm-hmm. work with people. I'm not about, like, I love judo to be profitable and stuff, but I'd rather spread the word of judo anyways. So to me, there always okay. should be two seminars. There should always be an adult seminar and a youth seminar. And with youth, maybe 13 and under, and then adults are like 13 and up maybe. So as you have some, someone that's more your size that can work with any of the adults, mm-hmm. or maybe 15 and up or 15 and under. But I think they should always be separated. Because the thing when you have one seminar and you have like five adults mm-hmm. and like 20 kids, it's tough. Because you get kids running around doing all kinds of crazy stuff, not listening. Some of them are, some of them aren't. You got adults really intensely wanting mm-hmm. to learn stuff like yourself. So I always think there should be two seminars. So I, I think if right now he's having, there are people already having trouble raising money through seminars. I don't think mm-hmm. doing the system is going to change anything because like they said, 90, like over 90% of the judokas are non-competitors. So when you have these seminars that are targeting the competitors, then you're not going to get those type, enough people showing up. I don't know because I'm not a seminar guy. I'm sorry. I'm one of those guys that I would love to go to some seminars, but I'm not a seminar guy. I only go to seminars when I really have to. It's usually just when I get my coach certification, I'll go to seminars. But other than that, I don't. You've gone to more than I have. We have a, one of our youth members, well, one of our, um, uh, what, how old is she? One of our early members in her 20s. I think it's shooting. Oh, okay. Yeah. She goes to almost all the seminars. Like there's a seminar she'll go to it and she's learned a lot from them. Does she mm-hmm. use it? So, so, but at least she goes there, opens her mind, learns some new things, learns some new tricks. Mm-hmm. You know? That's, that's how I see it. It was, uh, it was better than the BJJ seminar I went to where it's basically a handshaking event. It's was it? Completely... Yeah, I think it was, um, one, of the, I'm, I don't remember which Gracie, but one of the Gracie's, uh, seminar. And at the time I was a yellow belt. I'm like, Oh, this might be a good experience. And my Muay Thai instructor at the time was a BJJ black belt. So he was like, yeah, you, you, sh- you should go. It's like a good learning experience. So mm-hmm. I went, um, he taught me how to do a, a calf slicer, like a very simple calf slicer. No, uh-huh. There's nothing special about it. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh-huh. basically, um, and then how to pass the half guard, I think. And then the rest of the, the rest of the time was just, taking pictures with him yeah. and then at the end um there was a promotion of they basically I, I think some of the bjj gyms you have to like only get you can only get promoted if you pay for these seminars <laughs> so, yeah so i sat there for like half an hour because there was like 50 50 or something people in a room and i sat there and uh. out of that 50 people i think like 30 of them got pro- pro- promotions yeah, so I was waiting for them to that call a, each one, each person up and get their belts and mm. take a picture with this Gracie guy. So yeah, the because I'm a I'm a Tong Sudo guy as well. Like in Tong Sudo Karai, there's um there's a Tong Sudo master. I'm not gonna mention his name. That does the same thing. Where if you want to get promoted like past your uh, first don in, in Tong Sudo, I can't remember if it was like third or fourth, whatever it was. You have to have him come. He has to like you have to buy him dinner, pay mm-hmm. for his hotel room, give him a do- give him a gift of more money, which always gets me mm-hmm. to get your promotion to your next Dawn ranking, which blows my mind. But that happens. But it's I, actually happened be it's funny that you mentioned that because there was that one time that I don't know if you went to it, but there was that um there were a Korean dojo in the area mm-hmm. and they had a Korean national player or I can't remember what the guy was like. Yeah, I went to that one. Yeah. Yeah. And you told me that one also was one of those where he just was there training. No, oh that no, that wasn't that was one tech. Let's not talk let's not talk about that. I don't want to get in trouble. So <laughs> what you scared of him or something? That, no, it wasn't it wasn't a seminar. It basically wasn't a seminar. It was uh But I remember it, them I remember being sold at that. being a seminar. Let's just uh, leave whatever, it at that. Whatever. It wasn't a seminar. Oh, okay, um, okay, okay. But I guess my point of bringing it up is what Travis is saying is kind of similar to the affiliate system that these guys are having and bjj because the the person allowing you you to use their name like gracie baja or gracie kumueda or whatever Mm -hmm. they're they make you hold these seminars and they travel around they basically collect these fees of the students paying to take a picture of them and stuff and that's part of part that's part of why they have set all these requirements where you have to get promoted by going to these seminars so that you 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 get what i mean so let's just say like tra- what Travis is doing is not that, right? Yeah. But how do you ensure everyone else at the USA Judo or US- or the, the national government body doesn't have these thoughts? Like they get greedy and like, hey, 
this is uh doing good and but we can make more money if we uh start making everyone buy official USA judo geese for their their dojo. Uh-huh. You can't you can't get you can't get yeah. promoted unless everyone in your dojo has these geese. Yeah. Or no, I, hey, I, get, I feel you. Yeah. Or let's uh add another belt color here and make <laughs> people pay another 50 bucks to take this test you, you know trust saying, me right? it's tough enough to get people to pay for to pay for their promotions already you know i'm talking about people paying for every promotion paying for yellow belt orange belt green belt promotion already that already to me is like going to be pulling teeth because i got brown belts that have been brown belts for like three four years already that i'm like hey did you ever pay for your uh third q yet no so technically you're not even a certified brown belt then are you but then they well, ask me. They're, they're kind of shooting themselves in the, in the foot because then when it comes to get the black belt, they're going to be like, how long have you been a brown belt for? And there's no record of it. So Yeah. And that's when you got to tell people that stuff. It goes back to me about babysitting people too much. And that's the thing that he brought about the website. Having this judo website that has mm-hmm. all the information of all the judo players, their ranking, how long they've been there for. And that he was going to monitor it. Now, he's going to hire a whole IT department to monitor everybody's judo career. And they'll say, hey, you know, you've been a brown belt for three years now. And you're still just a third Q. Why haven't you got promoted yet? I don't know if they're going to call us or send them a letter or what they're going to do. You know? I just, I think that this is my opinion, but I would kind of like BJJ system where your belt is like tied to your sensei. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, sensei Philippe gave me my, my brown belt or my black belt or my second don, my third don. And that rank reflects him and his instruction. So you're, mm-hmm. you're his student. Kind of like in Kung Fu, right? But yeah, that's the same thing in BJJ. It's like I'm I'm a Gracie, whatever Renner Gracie or whatever Gracie's um, black belt. Then mm-hmm. there's a certain name to it, right? Yeah. You you don't need like IBJJF to certify your rank and show that you are a black belt. Like yeah, you. I, I think you do since we're well. It all goes back to where this being an Olympic sport and stuff. But I think you mm-hmm. need certain certifications to prove what you are. Because there's the thing in BJJ where you see guys like you see on YouTube fake BJJ schools or we're going P- to expose this guy. If, if you and run you the school, the same, sure. You can get the same thing with judo, you know? But or most people guys, aren't going to run school. I, I'm not going to run school. So. Most people aren't. Most people aren't. I say most aren't, but some are. Okay. So though some can go pay for that coach's certification they was talking about, like to open the school or yeah. sensei certification, but I don't think you need to force you sh- or even you should force everyone to pay for rank. I think you should. I think that's just going down the wrong direction. To me, like, let's, just, let's just, just say you're not paying for a rank. You're paying to, to me the way I think about that. You're paying to support the system. All right. You're paying to support. But USA why am Judo. I getting out of it? Right. You're getting a belt rank. You're getting a certified <laughs> belt rank. Okay. And I'll send you a happy birthday card if you want that too. All right. Okay, that's, that's where I disagree. So <laughs> yeah, I know. Cause you don't like paying for ranks. Uh, to I me, just, it's not it, a big it cheapens deal. the rank is how I see it. You're paying for, I don't see it paying for the belt rank. I see it paying for the certification. That's how I see it. You're a certified legit brown belt. You're a certified legit black belt. That's I how think I they, see they it. should just include that fee into the, the membership fee that you're paying. It shouldn't, I, I don't think you need to pay each rank. So instead of charging $50, $50 or $70 a year, then charge me 100 or 150 a year. For what? That inc- includes all the that the stuff that he was talking about, the certification, the mm-hmm. online, the online ranking registry, whatever. The membership should pay for all of that. I shouldn't have to pay for my rank to to support that. I think you should, because you're paying. For, it's not paying for a rank. You're paying for your certification of that rank. You're paying my membership for proof. Fee. Your membership fees are selling you're a member of the USA Judo or USA J, USJF. It, USA it really, Judo. to me, it really cheapens the the rank because think about it. When you graduate high school you worked for it, your taxes are paying for, for school or private school or whatever. And you worked hard for college or whatever. And yeah. now you're telling me I need to pay for, pay for that piece of paper. That the yeah. degree, like, don't you have to pay, didn't you have to pay for graduation? Did you have to pay for the tassel? No. Didn't you have to pay for the gown? Well, the tassel, that's different. All right. You're paying for the certification. Well, we, I paid for my own gi, my judo gi. I paid for it. <laughs> like, <laughs> so. I'll give you a judo tassel if you want. All right. <laughs> But like, like I said, um, I know I'm not going to go into it this podcast, but uh-huh. let's just say USA Judo doesn't have like the best history of the best interest of their members. <laughs> yeah, spending money the prop, proper way. Yeah. So That's how, 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 do you, 
how, if you implement the system, it, I can mm-hmm. totally see it going south and they're just like, okay, you got to buy a gi, you got to pay more belt fees and all that kind of stuff. And you got to start buying. I think they tried this in the past, actually. You got to buy this grading syllabus, mm-hmm. which, which is what a lot of BJJ clubs do. It's yeah. like, we have this um, the syllabus, but you have to pay for it. So, mm-hmm. and I've seen, I, I don't think they do that anymore, but I've seen, um, I think it was USJA used to do that. So buying a syllabus, hmm. yeah, that's interesting. You, you you don't know basically you don't know what they're gonna test for each rank unless you pay for that book. <laughs> so yeah, well, when we go to testing, it'd, it'd be nice to have one single syllabus. I get it. It'd be nice to be unified, everybody in the same suit, everyone the same way. I get it, but everyone they teach their own stuff. We've gone through this before with when we talk about people like getting their black belts and brown belts and stuff, what they need to learn, what they need to know. Every dojo is going to be different. At our dojo, we rarely test unless you ask to be tested or else you're going to take longer to get your belt rings. Your old dojo in Texas, you said, your sensei does, twi- does testing twice a year and that's it. So everybody does their own stuff when it comes that way. But when it comes to people out there paying for the ranks and stuff, I don't think they're paying for the ranks. They're paying for certification of that, that rank, proving that they're at that, proving that they're at that level. And what Travis Dean was saying is that there's going to be a competitor one, there's going to be a martial art one, and there's going to be a um, competitor, martial art, and self-defense one. So if you want to be a martial artist, you're going to learn all everything. You're going to learn the entire uh, Gokyo. You're going to learn all those throws. Okay? That's the other problem I have with it. It's going to start, people are going to start being like, your black belt's not worth as much as my black belt. Now they have that now already. They have that now because you... Well, they kind of changed. Yeah, but now, stuff. now it's not like written in stone. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's like I was a competitor, I got my black belt. Well, I, you know, I'm a martial artist, I got my <laughs> black belt. Yeah, like oh, you're you're um. Well, I guess I like BJ, s- some I BJJ black belt. I think some BJJ um, clubs have that uh the bar, the red bar, the white bar, the blue bar, and they mean different things in different dojos. Do I think that. one of them's like I'm a competitor. Another one's like um, I'm a black belt, but I don't teach. Mm-hmm. And then another one's like, I'm a black belt and I can't, I can teach kind of I thing. Can't, like, like they, here, you can't teach here, here, get this green, get this green bar on this guy. You're terrible. They're not, you they're teach. not an instructor. They're not an instructor. So I feel like that's going to be moving towards that. If you're going to divide the belt system up into something like that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, Travis even said it, he was like, man, I looked at, uh, he was like, I looked, I'm, I won silver medal and I looked at some of these syllabuses. I can't even get, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you how to do some of the, um, explain some of these things for a yellow belt test. Mm-hmm. That so, was an American syllabus he was talking about. It was talking about like what a French syllabus or. No, Israeli I think he was syllabus? talking, I think he was talking about American, right? Really? I, I think- but that, that defeats the whole point. He should, he should know these stuff is what I'm saying. Yeah. So you, do, do you really want, I mean, I actually met a couple of people in Japan that are like this, but do you want a black belt, like a high Don ranking black belt that can't tell you what an Ogoshi is? <laughs> Cause I, I only know, how, I, guy, I, I only know how to do Ushimata, I, but I don't I know what Ogoshi is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know a few already, <laughs> but I don't think it should be separate like that. So. I think you should know, in my opinion, I think you should know as a black belt, uh, at least how to demonstrate all throws. That's why when you go through to your black belt and you go through the first, uh, the first kata sets, you learn the basic throws that go through mm-hmm. uh, the 15 basic throws and stuff. I think you should know it, you know, five, 10, 15, 20, 25 basic throws, shit, whatever it is. I think you should know that. And if you don't know it and then you want to teach, it's tough because you're going to get people who ask you about a certain throw, ask you about something mm-hmm. and be like, oh, I, I, I don't know how to do it. Me, I want to know everything. So I learned every throw, how to do the basics on the same throw. Because I get people throw shit at me. You one day mm-hmm. come up with like, hey, Juan, how to do Yamadashi? I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. I can show it to somebody. Let me show you how to do it now. Nobody knows Yamadashi. All right. Well, well, you know the Kodokan is doing the those videos every week, so let's see how they demonstrate Yamarashi. Yeah. Let's <laughs> so, see. <laughs> so, um, I think the next thing he talked about, one of the things he talked about, was um, getting judo into BJJ schools. Mm-hmm. Like, basically, I think you have a strong opinion. I, I personally don't care, but I know you have strong opinions on that. Yeah, I get where he's coming about with that about more funding towards USA mm-hmm. Judo, and we so it's a way of 
getting more students to pay more dues to get more funding from USA Judo and to get more, more certifications out there. What I don't like about it is that it takes me years. It took me what, five years to get my black belt in Judo, okay? Dedication, going to class three days a week, going to competitions, getting points, doing everything I'm supposed to, learning my content to get my black belt. And from what it sounded like from his explanation is that if you have a BJJ black belt, and then you take these tests for his courses, for his white belt to green belt to get a first level coaching certificate. And then I would assume it would be um, green belt. It would be, it'd be blue to, um, or green to blue, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Green to blue to get your second certification and a brown belt certification and a black belt certification. And then you can teach judo at your club. If you're just doing the online classes and not going to actually learn judo, I don't think you're gonna be good enough to teach judo. You're not going to learn the balance breaking. You're not going to learn how to grip fight and how to hold things properly. So that's one thing I did not like. I like the idea of getting into more dojos, but I think maybe we should maybe advertise more to jujitsu schools, uh, Brazilian mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu schools that, hey, maybe we have a certified list of like, hey, these guys are certified instructors or coaches or sensei, whatever he wants to put them as. And they're looking for a job. And if you want to hire somebody, these are guys that you can hire. That's a good idea, yeah. For a once-a-week class or seminar, guys, you know? Like something that I've put out there is some BJJ place I've trained at. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. you guys know my judo guy. If you guys want to do a judo class, let me know. I'll hold a judo seminar here. I can do a nogi seminar. I know how to do nogi stuff. And their eyes light up and like, oh, that sounds great. But then they never want to follow through with it. So that's a separate I just, thing. I just find it interesting. He was so vocal about how we should stop trying to get judo into the schools but he, it's here tough. he is like trying to get it, into bjj school <laughs> saying we we shouldn't put it in schools but we should put it in bjj schools because i think it'd be easier to get it get it it'd be much easier to get into a bjj school than it is to get into but, US. Hey, you can walk there and chew is, gum you can do both there are schools in america that take wrestling out of their schools okay american wrestling an olympic yeah. sport that's been in every school forever that are taking wrestling out and you want to try to get judo in there a totally different sport that they're not used to mm -hmm. you could use the same area you can use the same wrestling mat area you can use the same wrestling room all you gotta do is make guys buy geese and if you want to be cheap about it just buy gi tops make your own wear shorts and just wear just gi tops you look like sambo players but at least you can still do judo with it i think um i i i want to bring up one thing it's that um one of my friends said that and one of the requirements, I think, Jimmy, I, I don't remember seeing this in the video, but one of the requirements that Jimmy Pedro said mm -hmm. was to make these BJJ schools hold more judo classes. Mm -hmm. Like one of the requirements of giving them a certification is that they have to hold more judo classes. Yeah. Do you think that's a good idea? Definitely. Kids judo classes. Because if you don't practice it, you're not going to learn it. That's no, what I'm, I'm saying... About it. Well, I'm so, saying forcing these businesses to yeah. say, hey, you, we can give you a certification to teach judo, but you have to hold at least X amount of kids' classes a day or a week. A day or a week or something. Basically a minimum. They didn't say how many, but like a minimum amount. Mm -hmm. so, I, don't, I don't think you should be able to tell someone how to, how to uh, run their, their business. Well, then it goes to the point of that where if you want to get a real judo black belt, then learn judo. You can teach them any classes you want. But if you're going to take this easy route of becoming a sensei or a coach, then I can't remember what, which one you wanted to use it was, then you have to do our requirements. Okay. So I think the last thing. But then it's going to people up of like just saying, oh, well, okay, so you have a black belt or you're a certified coach in USA Judo. And they ask, like, what kind do you have? Oh, well, I'm a certified instructor, coach, sensei, whatever thing. Level, you know? level one. I'm teacher. a level one instructor. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I think the last thing he talked about is basically turning USA Judo into a consultancy, like how to teach and help people to start and run their own dojos. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a good idea? Or, and how, how they like change their national governing body into that role? I think they are. I think they should be doing that already. I think USA Judo should already be trying to help people broaden judo out to more people, expand it. You know, USA Judo should already be putting commercials out there. Should already be sponsoring things to show judo. This is the last we talked about last time, also about mm -hmm. um, the John Wick thing. You know, yeah. USA Judo should have videos showing the throws that John Wick was doing and showing them in judo. 
Instead, we got BGJ schools showing bad judo throws and saying that they're BGJ throws. Okay. <laughs> That, that reminds me of a video someone posted today. I don't want to put him on blast, but basically someone demonstrated a, a Tani Yatoshi, which is exactly how I hurt my knee. So, mm -hmm. God, they're just but, uh, slamming. And that's another throw that, that's a, again for another, we just talk about dangerous throws sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I agree. I they should they, already they, be doing that. That they should, should be their be role. Helping people. They should already be helping dojos out. They should be like doing this week's gym here or holding more seminars and things in certain in certain cities you know more i think seminars, usa judo's gathering. role should be advertising which is what a lot of well yes gym, yes like usa gymnastics well, i don't want to say they did a great job but i think they do a pretty good job like putting their their athletes on cnn and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and we, we i think we tried that but i don't recall seeing it on tv that much but <laughs> when Compared to, like, when Kayla won Olympic twice, right? Mm -hmm. How often you twice. saw her on T How often you saw her on TV compared to how often you saw the USA gymnasts when they won gold, how often you saw them on TV? I know what you should do. We're supposed to, like, um, just bomb shows, just <laughs> send judo players out there. Hey, the, like I said, anime series. <laughs> or, ri or write a rap song. I don't know. Like, guys, start rappers. thinking outside the box. <laughs> Like Star, I mean that that's how Patron became a thing. Because some rapper Patron paid some rapper to mention Patron yeah. in, their, in, their, in their rap song. Yo so. yo yo, USA Judo. Oh, <laughs> God. so I no, just think they, they should, a, USA Judo should already be helping people. USA Judo should already be mm -hmm. advertising. USA Judo should be the front line right there, getting websites up. Should be getting Instagram hits. Should be on a TikTok doing stupid dances with judo. Okay. Yeah, let me check what they're I I never ever check USA Judo's Instagram because it's always something like I have it not really don't related post, to judo. They, they don't, don't really post, post anything. No, no. Which brings they, they also don't advertise their live streams. Like um when they held nationals they, they mm -hmm. uh live streamed it. Yeah. And they never advertised it. I had to like actively look for it. It was really hard. Well, and they also they, use their own. The, was it three, maybe four years ago? They started doing a live stream and they mm -hmm. they put it on blast. Like they were telling everyone, they sent all the dojos. They put a lot of Insta on uh, Facebook at the time. And they've done it since then. But yeah, they've only talked about maybe like the first year. They talked about it a lot. But after that, mm -hmm. they've kind of been hush hush. Like the previous year, know, the previous year, they, um, I was watching it on their platform it's not youtube it's their their own like streaming platform you go on their site for and it's terrible like <laughs> it's completely just, just terrible use you, just you youtube guys it's easy just use youtube or, or right. even tw I, I i suggested twitch before because that's where that's a new modern thing yeah use twitch yeah like vo volleyball is doing it like the oh, I, can't, I can't remember that leak's name but it's it's out here in manhattan beach in hermosa mm -hmm. beach they stream on twitch and all these people are watching it and yeah. i think you just have to pay twitch some money to put that stream on the front page so when people load up twitch that's like the first thing that pops up and starts playing and yeah people are like oh what's that like i'm watching it now mm -hmm. or um you can pay some influencers to i hate that term but pay some influencers <laughs> to to try out a judo class for a week right uh -huh. Do an Instagram I, post about it. Like do a, lately, do a TikTok. you know, you know what the cool thing is now lately? Chess. What? Chess. Yeah. Chess, because mm. some some of the popular streamers are playing chess. Yeah. With with a chess grandmaster, like mm -hmm. he's teaching these people chess. Yeah. And now all these people are starting to get interested in chess because their favorite streamer or uh, influencers like playing chess on stream. Now imagine right, so what, if you. So what you're saying is I gotta go find an influencer record throwing them and then we'll become popular right i mean it's worth a try like <laughs> it's cheap it's cheap i think paying them like let's say like five thousand dollars that's how much travis stevens was asking for a seminar right yeah so some, somewhere around there paying the five five thousand dollars to take judo class twice even just twice or three mm -hmm. times how, how much just, is it how I much is that for an hour that you're paying him right just throw the shit out of the entire class. Just get the crash pad out. Just I them. think yeah. I think it's worth a try to see, just to probe to see what that market's like, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but right now, chess is the hot thing. So right. maybe it won't be in like a couple of weeks or a couple so of months. So make a at least you left it. Video. Even if you, even if the people 
stop watching judo like after the, the fad's gone at least mm-hmm. you educated the, the kids like what judo is and they know what it is like i said before we gotta do more education we have get judo out there okay usa judo usjf usa usja should all be doing that already they should, their top thing should be advertising and getting judo out there and with the way Travis Stevens was talking, at least he wants to put it out there. He wants to make it more popular somehow. I think he's still seeing it from just the competitor's view, which is not very grassroots. But I, yeah. I see it as a grassroots thing, as like the more people you get um, exposed to judo, eventually the competition sure. scene will, will come. Yeah, up. the bigger net that we cast, the more better players we'll get. Yeah. You know, We'll get wrestlers. We'll get uh, good football players or something. So when I grew up doing this stuff, it's like, hey, that pre- looks pretty fun. You know, we will get some good BJJ guys that grew up doing BJJ and now want to get into judo and just become good competitors. But that's the whole thing. We just need to get more education, cast the net out there, and get bring more people in. So okay. I think that's the, that's the end of the conversation, I think, right there. Yeah, we're coming up on the hour mark. So Are we? Uh, See, this, is, this, is a, this is a long one, yeah. So. <laughs> I told you this would be a long one. Is there anything else you want to bring right. up? No, just this, everybody, please like, share, and subscribe to us. Follow us on our uh, on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. If you guys have any questions, please hit us up on our um, hit us oh, up on. Oh, wait! Before we we got a listener's email. Oh, did we? We got an email. All right, let's hit us. Yeah. I I don't know. I think his name was Gerard. I don't know if you want me to read it. I'm not. So Gerard says, "Listen to your third podcast. I have to say, the light grabs are a hell yeah." The leg grabs are part of the original overview of judo. I think the IGF going for a pure Olympic style judo are cutting time and time again without thinking of the true judo. Cutting time and time. I think it's a typo. Or maybe it's uh, not his first language. For the Olympic purists, they need to ask what would Kano say to me. Time for the judo players to take over. Anyway, on a more realistic note, enjoying the podcast heard about you from Dave Roman's podcast. Keep it up. Oh, he's from Ireland. Okay. Irish. So yeah. now say an Irish accent now. <laughs> I'm terrible at accent. You're the ac- you're the one who's an actor here. So, well, Gerard, thanks for listening. And yeah, I think this is in response to our, us talking about like grabs and. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Well, like I said, if anybody has any feedback, if anybody has any questions, please leave it at our um, drop us an email uh, on our Facebook. Uh, that's supposedly it. If you want to hit up on Instagram, you hit up me on my Instagram. You hit Anthony up on his Instagram. And if we get enough questions, maybe we'll do a whole question episode one day. Yep. Just maybe we'll do some questions at the end of the episode. Maybe we'll do a whole episode of questions. But please like, share, follow, subscribe, and hit us up these numbers. All right. Yep. You got anything to say, Anthony? See you guys later. No. Nope. Bye. <laughs>